curator and artistic director and co-founder of PhotoFest International in Houston. Um, Tamor Grane is a dedicated collector. Um, he started the popular Art of the Middle East blog and has recently opened Tamor Grane Gallery, which supports various artists but um, has a very strong roster of uh, Middle Eastern and North African artists. And for a slightly longer introduction, <laughs> this is Fadi uh, Hussein. Fadi um, was born in Kuwait um, to exiled Palestinian parents. Uh, his father was an ambassador of Kuwait, uh, which uh, had Fadi and his family move around quite a bit. Um, they lived in the United States, Morocco, um, Tokyo. Um, and at the age of 15, uh, Thadiyat moved back to Kuwait uh, to live with his aunt and finish high school. Um, and then he later moved on to New York, uh, where he pursued a Bachelor's of Fine Arts at NYU. And um, moved on to do his Master's in Arts um, at New Mexico, University of New Mexico. Um, but it was not all school in photography. Um, he also led a life that included meeting tables bartending, uh, <laughs> driving a New York City uh, taxi cab, Ooh. yeah, and selling beer and hot dogs at Madison Square Garden. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he began his academic career in Sharjah, at the American University of Sharjah, uh, where he was professor of photography, and he has recently been appointed professor of photography at NYU in Abu Dhabi in 2013. So in his work, um, his figure is present within the frame, as you'll see the slides and his photographs around you, um, almost always dressed in black. The, re the figure can represent anyone and no one. Uh, the spaces pictured are varied, but mostly depict vast, open, uh, barren desert land, uh, which used to upcoming development. While in other images, we see the figure again dressed in black, uh, face covered with a kufiya, um, the symbol for solidarity with Palestine. Uh, he is moving across spaces, airports, trucks, um, commercial meat refrigerator, and even Scotland Yard. Um, he later carries a group of blue or green carp, um, digs holes, arranges potted plants, um, throws rocks into piles. Um, and finally, in his latest series, he's in Kuwait amongst dilapidated architecture. Um, the ruins of a once vibrant um, and blooming landscape. So Thadip's work has appeared in international solo and group exhibitions here in the United States, the UK, Spain, Germany, France. Um, he's shown extensively throughout the Middle East. Um, he's recently represented Kuwait in the country's first official representation at the Venice Biennale in, in 2013. And um, he was part of Photo K Photography Biennial in Paris. Um, and his work is part of several permanent collections, uh, Guggenheim Museum in New York, Victoria and Albert Museum in London, Royal Museum in photography, uh, of Photography in Copenhagen, Mori Art Museum in Tokyo, Dada Tifunun in Amman, and Sharjah Art Foundation collection in Sharjah. So it's a very long list, but I thought it was really important that we get to know you a little bit more. Um, and I just also wanted to get Thadip warmed up a little bit um, with a quick 10 questions. <laughs> <laughs> push ups. Yeah, all right. Almost like push ups, okay? Very short answers. Okay. All right, ready? Film or digital? Digital. Sound like the police, so you can turn it Okay, sound. yeah. <laughs> And are you one of those obsessive photographers that immediately looks at the uh, screen after taking a picture? No. <laughs> no. Matt, pearl, or glossy? Generally Matt. Do you have an assistant that pushes the button or do you use a wireless trigger? I use a wireless trigger. Do you have a uniform for the pictures that you keep in your trunk? <laughs> I do, somehow, yes. Although I'm wearing black you, shirts. You are wearing it right now. I do always have extra black shirts in the trunk. When do you wake up? Six, five thirty. Do you shoot at dawn? No. How do you take your coffee? All right. Fall. So how do you take your coffee then? Block. <laughs> 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 Other than being an artist and professor, what's your next favorite job? Probably the vendor. Yeah. And I heard. 
Jeffrey, you're a basketball player. What's your best what? game? My best game? Hitting the, my best friend, I think, in the regular six show one on one. That was fun. Good. All done. All right. Yeah, so, right. <laughs> you like really better? Yeah. Okay, good. So, um, I'd like to start with a series that got uh, people talking about your work. Um, in a way that reflects your personal history, uh, your personal story, and how it explores universal statements of loss, identity, and home. And it's the uh, series, the self-portrait series. Um, you've been quite privileged to live in many homes, uh, New York, New Mexico, Tokyo, Kuwait, UAE. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could speak a little more about this idea of the artist uh, making these statements about displacement and loss. And you know, maybe you can even begin with how you conceived of this idea. I think it's probably easier for me to speak about my own relationship to it. Um, I started the self portrait series with the scarf because I was a little bit fed up with the way Palestinians were being represented in, in the media generally. And I, I was actually never liked sort of self portraiture or constructive imagery. My background is more of documentary street photography. Um, and that project, actually, the scarf, was the first project I ever did where I started to manipulate the scene, or more so. And I think one could always argue that street photography was, always has a degree of manipulation, but that, that was sort of, images were constructed in my mind before I knew. Okay. Um, one of your iconic images in the series has you uh, gazing out into the Dead Sea um, towards Jerusalem. Um, and I remember you telling me it wasn't a very easy shot. Can you tell us the story about that? Yeah, that project, again, the self-portrait series, I was about to quit that project. I was living in Sharjah at the time, and I went to Jordan for vacation to take a break, get away from what I was doing, and start thinking of other things. And I was driving from Aqaba down to um, Petra along the uh, Dead Sea. And I saw Palestine actually for the very first time. I think it was Jerusalem, but it was uh, part of Palestine. And I thought this was amazing. And I, I happened to have a scarf with me in the trunk, so I thought, let me stop. I pulled over and set up the tripod to take a picture. And on the way back to the car, there was a policeman behind me. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought maybe he was just upset because I had parked illegally. Um, and we do that a lot. <laughs> in the Middle East, I have to say. Um, and it was sort of just on a not busy highway, but a small road. So I took out my driving license and I handed it to him. I said, Look, I'm really sorry, I was parking him. And he said, Come with me. And I said, Look, sorry, I'm just on the way to Petra. I wanted to take a picture. Is there a problem? He said, Come with me. So he took my license and I followed him down to the police station. It's about 150 meters away. And I went to the station and told me to sit down. I spent about 40 minutes there until the precinct captain called me inside. And he said, Are you target us? I said, Yes. I'm uh, really sorry that you know, this parking caused such an issue. Uh, <laughs> and he said, You're sorry, you'll see, but you'll be sorry. And he threw my passport across the room. And he said, Wait. What passport? Uh, a passport. I have a Kuwaiti passport. Um, and he said, The Muhammad are coming for me. Muhammad is something Very like. Uh, <laughs> Uh, CIA, something like that, CID, um, yeah. and it was very, he wouldn't tell me what the issue was, and I felt like a little bit of a Kafka novel, because I was being detained, but no one would tell me why, and so eventually the Muhabarat came, picked me up and took me to another place, and the question started, like, where are you from, why are you doing this, film or digital, that's how we said that. <laughs> <laughs> It was kind of scary. And then I was like, it's, it's digital. I said, how many pictures? 36 or 24? And I said, it's different. And he's yelling at me, 36 or 24? And I said, it's different. It's digital. He said, 36 or 24? I said, 11. I just threw out a number. So I had to sign a paper that I took 11 pictures. And then, I don't want to belabor it, I was detained for 24 hours. The story has been gone from 24 hours to a month in jail, but it's really, it's grown so much. But it's 24 hours, we constantly like, who are you, why are you doing this? And it was very scary, and it really made me realize that the scarf was something that even the Arabs have an issue with. It kind of represents sort of, you know, 
the resistance, like you said, the people associated with terrorism, and it was an epiphany uh, for me. But the great thing is, uh, they didn't know how to delete the picture. <laughs> yeah, um, that was actually amazing. So, like, eventually they let me go, and I got in the car, and when I drove out of the Mukhabarat office, uh, I opened up the camera, and the picture popped up, and I was just like, uh, thank God. Um, so I kept it. And it actually ended up on I think the one of the New York Times uh, like an art page because it was showing at the Charger Bay Mountain. Yeah. So I sent them a copy. I said, you know, thank you. But that incident opened up a lot of doors for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, so I'm interested in talking about landscape in the sense of its representations and um, also in your work, in Planet's work, but also about how land is developed. Um, so Planet puts this into play in his photographs with the C-series, D2 series, and in Unification. And when I look at these uh, photographs, I sometimes recall American photography of the 1960s, like how we're talking about Robert Adams, Louis Baltz, um, photos of these new suburban developments um, in American city limits, which of course came out of the baby boomers moving um, into suburban houses in many underdeveloped uh, American landscapes, which actually look very much like the Gulf today under development um, and under this construction. Um, so Wendy, I would like to hear your perspective, um, how you consider Tadis use of the landscape, uh, but also how his work has the capability to touch on images made by other artists who also portrayed the changing landscape in a similarly, almost even deadpan manner. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I just I share, this is um, a book that we just did from an Arab exhibition that PhotoFest did, and it actually reads with Tarek's images. Um, yeah. And the C and B series, which are Actually, a little more brightly printed than the book, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're welcome to come and look at this later. Targ asked me, um, because I spent my life in photography as opposed to the Middle East, um, if I could think about his work in the context of photography and photographic art. And I want to go back further, of course, than, than you did, because the way that Tarek uses scale, very, very vast expanse visually, um, and impose, I mean, puts himself in a very, very small way. Very noticeable, but it's very small. Um, and there, are, there is a tradition in 19th and early 20th century photography in the United States, in Europe, no, say where and how in Europe, um, and in Latin America. In Latin America and the United States, in very different ways, land was essential to self-identity and the development of those nation states. And in Brazil, which has in some ways similar histories to the United States, um, there was an extraordinary photographer of French origin, Marc Vernet, who did a series of landscape photographs, um, first on his own initiative, and then for the last emperor of Brazil, Dom Pedro, who you may know also freed the slaves um, in Brazil. He was quite a remarkable man, interested in photography and science. And he hired Marc Vernet to take these magnificent, large-scale images of Brazil, particularly the swath of Brazil that throws from just north of Rio de Janeiro down south of Sao Paulo. And the purpose of it was to bring settlement into Brazil, to bring uh, particularly craftspeople and um, workers from Europe. In his pictures, Ferrez always put one figure or two figures, very, very small proportionally to the grandeur of the landscape. And in Brazil, like in the western part of the United States, the landscape is 
extraordinarily grand. Um, and the idea was, of course, to make the human being a very small element in the largeness of the land. Well, in the United States, um, we had similar purposes for the land of the West and taking, say, from west of the Mississippi to the coast. We pretended that it was empty <laughs> and that it needed settlement. And one of the ways in which we did that was to um, commission people like Jim Theo Sullivan and Carlton Watkins, engineers, photographers, image makers, to photograph the grandeur of the West. Um, and it also filled literature. It was to get settlers moving um, West and to populate that part of the world. Timothy O'Sullivan, more than Carlton Watkins, but both of them used the human figure in exactly the same way that Marc Ferrez had done. European photographers who traveled to the Middle East, in particular Egypt um, and Jordan, and also then to China, did exactly the same thing. That it was not difficult to make the pyramids and the Egyptian desert look grand and exotic and fantastic. And the purpose was to promote the growing tourism industry in Europe. And what did they do? Small human figures in this large and very grand landscape. So that has remained um, an important part of photographic tradition and history and has very much to do with both the question of politics and the question of identity of human beings and human society relative to the land. Now jump to the 60s. Then this new topographic. Was it 70s? Yeah. It was, um, I mean, photographers have been doing um, photography of sort of suburbanization of the landscape and the changing of the boundaries between urban society suburban society and the land, particularly west, from, from the Midwest to the coast, to the West Coast, before. But there was a very famous exhibition called New Topographics done by George Eastman Thompson in the 70s. Um, and as Frank Balky, one of the main photographers in that exhibition, how many photographers? Twelve? Yeah, there's plenty of that thought that it was just going to be one of those passing phases in photographic history. But new topographics became one of the most important and most influential shows ever um, in US photographic history. And probably it, it, it affected also um, people in, in Europe, or photographers in Europe as well. And what it did was it, it did the opposite from what Carlton Watkins had Timothy O'Sullivan and less than lesser figures that followed them. It wasn't about the grandeur of the unspoiled landscape. It was about how the landscape was being despoiled by suburbanization and cookie cutter houses that, you know, lined the West Coast between San Francisco and Los Angeles um, in the seventies. So I actually see Tarek's work more in line. <laughs> although the intentions are very different, with, in terms of its formalism, scale and light, and the relationship of the human figure to, to the land, more in terms of 19th, early 20th century photography mm -hmm. than new topographics. But he is certainly dealing with, in a very ambiguous way, I think, with land and the transformation of land. Mm -hmm. And what a, oh, sorry, please. No, I was going to say some bad things. New topographic, you know, no, that did have a lot of effect on me. I think I was at NYU actually at the time when that really became popular, and I think everyone at the time really misjudged the work. But when you first look at it, it seems a little bit pessimistic, <laughs> um, and I don't, and I had thought so. But he prefaced the book with a quote by Lauren Isaac: "Nothing is ever lost, but can never be again as it was," and that really made you reconsider looking at the work. I think it would have been. 
very easy for atoms in the whole moon to really focus on a lot of other damaged landscapes, but they tried to maintain a kind of, or show a kind of, that they're still beautiful, but we needed to be aware and we couldn't ignore the changes that were going on. Does that occur to you while you're, when you're shooting in these landscapes? Uh, depending on which body of work, but I think a little bit differently. I think there, although I, my work is still documentation and nature, I think it's very different because I use it more as a kind of scene to act out somehow or something that I want to try and, and say or show or I'll interact with the environment in a way that the new top graphics really weren't trying to do that. Yeah. No, they didn't. Yeah. And what you're doing for sort of performance wise, yeah. relative to the landscape, is something that's a very part of modernist photography. It, didn't, it was not a part of earlier yeah. photography. I'm curious what um, Timur, um, how Timur sees the landscape functioning here, um, but more so also in this broader sense, having worked with so many contemporary artists from the Middle East, and now you're working with uh, Goddard and, and really looking at his images. How do you see the landscape function? Well, what first attracted me to Tarek's work originally was that he was so different from many of the other artists that are coming out of the Middle East, um, that he does take, um, he does focus on the landscape, he does focus in a not so um, obvious way on the development of his, the city he lives in Abu Dhabi. And what interested me is, in a lot of his work, there's always signs of development, but there is no development. You know, you have, I mean, the cranes, you have pits, you have ladders, you have machines, um, but there's no sign of development. What interested me initially in his work was Abu Dhabi itself and what they're building, um, and how Tariq documents that through his photos. Um, I mean, there's so much building going on in Abu Dhabi and Saudi Arabia. Um, it could, but at the same time, it could be anywhere, and I think that's what's interesting. In the K Files the series that we currently have on exhibition at the gallery, which we opened yesterday, Tark tracks the development of Kuwait uh, as a modern state by looking at all the different structures and buildings that were important to Kuwait, uh, to Kuwait's growth initially. I think. Part of that has come into his landscape photography, even though it was prior to his new series. He's in a way tracking and documenting the changes in Abu Dhabi through the landscape. I mean, another interesting factor about his photos that I find interesting was Tariq being Palestinian and Kuwaiti, living in Abu Dhabi, previously living in Sharjah. He's also a transplant. And in the photos, you have transplanted trees and herbs and brushes and flower, fauna and flower from wood different type, parts of the world. So that's what's interesting. What interested me was Tariq's relationship to the land and the landscape and the place he was in um, and how he focused on that. Um, and even though it's more evident in the K-Files, um, which we're showing, I think it's quite evident as well in the older works. Um, when I first came across Tariq's work, a lot of people first come across Tariq's work, um, they first come across the self-portrait series, which is the uh, one where he's wearing the Kithaya. I actually came across, it was one of these series, I can't remember which ones initially, um, but I came across his work through one of these series and that really interested me initially. Um, and then I learned more about Tark's history um, and that made a lot of sense with his work. Um, and I think people everywhere can relate to it because a lot of people don't live where they come from initially and this feeling of um, being alone in your surroundings. Um, um, you know, in such a small, when you're such a small person with these crazy large surroundings, um, I find that interesting, uh, Tark's work, and one where people can relate to. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you and Amor a question? Why, in terms of particularly media related work, photography, video, I don't know about painting some from the Middle East, is there such little presence of land as a subject or artistic expression? And that has been such a big yes. topic and problem in the Middle East. It's funny that there hasn't been so much done on land. It's a good question. But no, I don't think there are many artists that are working specifically with land and landscape, and especially photographers. Do you know of any other? Um, I'm causing a bit. Yeah. It's not the Saudi Arabia. Um, hasn't changed a lot of 
performance is that the desert being more documented um, back in the 70s. Um, there, I, I mean, I think land is very present. It's just used in various ways. Um, it can also, uh, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be kind of portrayed in the same way as clients portraying it. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, the idea of like the, the land or the landscape or, um, uh, and that place of where one is, where one settles or where one is from. I'm trying to not use certain words. <laughs> um, uh, I think that's evident in, in actually many, many works. I mean, uh, you know, one of the artists actually, Nikki Majumi, is, uh, is a painter and he is, uh, you know, a lot of his work actually represents our land. Mm -hmm. You know, he might be speaking of moments in history of Iran. Uh, so that is, it is present, but it isn't visualized necessarily in, certain, in the same sense. So I mean, that's how I kind of think about it. So, um, but I guess what's interesting about Planet's work is that um, the, that this could be kind of anywhere if you do not know where it is, which really opens up um, the, the discussion. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to why you're also thinking about that it could be like maybe a cultural signifier, especially with showing his work at um, yeah, view, the, yeah. view from inside um, and the, there's the, it was like the, the Arab programs listing mm -hmm. as I saw on the website. So that's kind of what I, I was interested in asking you in terms of the landscape being this dominant cultural signifier to you and to hear. I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, I understand the words, but yeah, yeah Tarek is one of the few um, artist other than a Palestinian woman who is actually dealing with what I would call land or landscape. So mm -hmm. I don't think we put actually much emphasis on it, literally, mm -hmm. figuratively, metaphorically, yes, but, but other than two Palestinian of origin artists, right. nobody else was really dealing with it. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, we had showed um, Tarek's self-portrait work, and I was interested in his work for a long time, but I'm also interested in, in sort of his ambiguous role in, in the landscape, because modern landscape photography, dealing with some of the issues that are kind of underlying the work, is much more overtly mm -hmm. political and ideological, where his relationship, and I think it's very interesting, his relationship to the land in the particularly CD and not in beautification series perhaps is more direct, but C and D um, are rather ambiguous in a very interesting way. What is the human role relative to transformation and change? And I don't think he sort of takes a position and pictures don't take a position. I think we find that interesting. <laughs> I mean, she's she's saying that you know there the images are not taking a position. If I'm understanding you correctly, that not that direct that position overtly. is not the position is rather ambiguous as opposed to like other works um, in in beautification. I think. Every series is a little bit different, so it's hard to speak for totality. But I, I think in C, I do actually. I think it is very much about sort of how boundaries and, and things actually are constantly changing. I think in all of them, and I think that is the position. Actually, uh, um, I think being, there are more than two positions, probably or something. And I think it is an observation that I'm looking at, um, and I think there is actually. What I would call it, uh, it, dep it depends how you define the word position somehow. I feel like it's set up in a way that two sides are antithetical to each other. Um, I think that I stand back 
and make the observation and say, at least in seed, it is a, the land transformed and the boundaries transformed. Mm -hmm. But your pictures say, unlike <coughs> Joel Sternfeld or a number of people, to, or Richard Beats, right? Mm -hmm. Are not taking, it's not clear that that's a good or bad, that you're not taking a position whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, those boundaries. I don't think it's my role in the sediment, it's no. more no, like to ask the question. Think, yeah. That's what yeah. I think is interesting about what you're doing. Because, like, someone likes to I, I like them a lot, but I, I, uh, there's an irony in this work that's there a lot. Uh, and I think that irony makes it seem like he's being very cynical in some way. Mm -hmm. I'm reading it right. Yeah. Um, the base record takes very definite critical decisions sure. about what's happened in the last one. It's not a better work. Yeah, no, but even if one would say about it to Robert Adams, even, I mean, they are making, they're trying to be neutral, but there is no trust. Yeah. On, and it's, I think he's asking the questions, so we're asking the viewer to look somehow. Well, that's, I mean, it's interesting that you say that because I, I wanted to ask you about um, the way that you present us with the image uh, visually is rather flat and um, it's usually, you know, with the layers of you have your sand, you have your horizon line, you have your sky and to me it seems to fall on the same plane. Um, and I'm just wondering how much of it is your formal language um, and how much of it is you kind of describing the particular landscape or that region or what is uh, being done to that landscape? I don't see the line between the two somehow. I mean, I think it's a, it's a combination of the two. I think it is a little bit about the land that's in front of me. Like the Kuwait series is very different because yeah. of what I'm looking at somehow. Um, <coughs> and yes, these are sort of so a traditional way of treating, and then it's also something you tell you never do in for in the school, like mm -hmm. you know, divide it up like that. Right. Teach them, no, you can't do that. Um, but yeah, I, I tend to do that. I, I mean, I think, and somehow I won't say I let the land dictate, but I think like this series in particular, there is a sort of approach to it. But I think it's a bit different in every series. A bit, but it's also hard to kind of miss. I mean, this is the, this is what it is. Yeah, no, I'm sure. Yeah, that it is. Um, but that's why I say it's like a combination of the two. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, so let's move on to K-Files. Um, so as Tamor mentioned, it's just opened yesterday at Tamor Grani Gallery, and you should definitely go see it if you haven't had the chance yet. Um, because in this series, thought it goes back to Kuwait um, and shoots in spaces where he again intervenes with his body and I'm calling it interventions as opposed to performances, but um, I, uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear from you, Tamor, about you know, organizing this show, but with these works in particular, as opposed to something else. That's a good question. For me and Tarek, it's his, it, this solo show that we have now is his, is his first solo exhibition in the US, so we thought it was important um, that we come in first of all with the most recent body of work, which is the K Files. Second of all, um, the K Files at the Venice Biennial last year got a lot of great coverage and great press, but not a lot of people were able to see it because, you know, from the US and Venice isn't too close. So I thought it would be interesting to bring that here. Um, I also think it's very relevant to the US. Um, Tark's father was a Kuwaiti ambassador to the US in the late 60s. and down, it's, we have a two floor space upstairs where the images are, are similar to Tark's, but just stamp photographs. Downstairs we have um, uh, old articles, scanned old articles on Daimon, um, articles about Tark's parents. Um, and it was a lot of society magazines write about his parents. And it was always interesting to see what American writers and journalists were writing about Tark's parents back in the 60s. They, you know, Tark's mom was very stylish, his dad was also very stylish. Um, they were very social, they had a lot of great parties, and it was interesting to see how shocked the media was in the late 60s. Look how, you know, like the Arabs are like us, in a way, you know, they have parties and they wear nice clothes. And, and so that was, it's really interesting if you have time to go and read the articles. Um, 
it's I don't know if oriental is the right word, but it's, yeah. it is a, it is yeah. a way of orientalizing Clark's parents. Um, so there was a definite connection between the U.S. and the show, um, and the way those two bodies of work are connected is uh, because it brings back Tar brings Tar back to Kuwait. Um, this was the first body of work right, that was shot in Kuwait, um, and it all connects to Tar's past and his childhood. Um, and I just thought it was a really interesting series to start off with in the, U in the U.S. because of the American connection, um, because of the Venice Biennial, um, and also because. It stands for greater themes, it stands for development. Um, um, there's a great emphasis on architecture in the world, themes that everybody here can relate to. You know, New York is a, a megalo megalopolis, megalopolis? Mm -hmm. whatever, you know, big city. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's a big city, there's been a lot of development, and like in Kuwait, you have these big, like, really important um, monuments, like the Stock Exchange here, the Opera House. Um, Tar goes back to these important places in Kuwait, like the Stock Exchange, uh, the old sports clubs. Um, uh, one, of, and in one of my favorite pictures is where the British first drilled for offshore gas in Kuwait. It's an island called Umm al Gas, which means mother of gas island. Um, and it's right off the shore. And that was a crucial, uh, that piece of land was a crucial, uh, crucial in Kuwait's history and their relationship with oil in the West. Um, so I just think there are a lot of also similarities between not the development of Kuwait and New York, but the development of big cities in general. I thought it was a good city to show I think, I think your, your point of view is interesting because I, you're looking at the development, but I'm looking at his, the dilapidated yeah. um, architecture as the landscape. And, um, you know, there are these images of somehow, like, they look like socialist constructions. Um, and, it, again, it could look like it was shot anywhere if you don't know Kuwait. Um, so it's surprising to see them that way. Uh, if you know about Kuwait's past, um, it was a it had a thriving cultural scene um, in the 70s. I mean, Boney M was there in 78. Um, Andy Warhol in 77. Um, you know, so uh, it the way that it's represented in uh, the K files, it's it, it, it's a stark difference. So I'm curious about um, if these sites are of interest because you see them as a foretelling of a possible future of some of the sites of construction in your other work. So, you know, what what do your pictures tell us about the past and the possible future? Let's go back a step, I think, because the, the way for me the, the two bodies of work link is really more about the idea of tracking, I think, because uh, the, the series that is kind of difficult to talk about, I don't know if any of you are here, but I found, I was doing a search on my father and I found an image of my dad giving me Jackie Onassis a $50,000 check on um, behalf of Kuwait for JFK Memorial Library. And I was able to buy that on eBay, and I bought it and ordered it. And then, looking a little bit further, I found an image, that same image on Amazon.com, and I ordered a canvas about the size of these images. You could choose the color of the canvas, etc. cetera. Um, and I started to find other images that were also in the family album, like the newspaper clippings, and they were actually sold by the journalist who wrote the original articles. I think what was, Interesting for me with that body of work, and it's not just about my family per se, but it's really also the commodification of family history or history. And that you can find these images and, and, and I found strangers and bid, a stranger could bid on that. And I think a lot of the language in the newspaper says as much about the Middle East as it does about Washington and the Americans' uh, situation in Washington DC at the time. Two of the articles speak about the issues of the Palestine was in 68, and a lot of the language that was talked about then, uh, I remember showing it to a friend of mine, and she was shocked. It's like the exact same language now, um, and issues uh, of the situation in Palestine now, that have uh, been going on. Now, going back to the other work, um, I think those buildings that you talk about, Kuwait was a leader in the 70s. It has changed. I think the stock market uh, crashed, but also the, the invasion. I think ever since that, 
they haven't really been able to pick it back up somewhere. And I'm talking to friends and everyone's a little bit less willing to step out of the side of themselves. And I think that's an issue in Kuwait. But these structures we're talking about, it was a beautiful, gorgeous building that was done in, in the 70s by the Indian firm that was made for uh, Kuwait citizens, uh, free government housing, but no one really wanted to live in it. They wanted villas, they wanted to live in a garden and everything. And now it's low income housing, uh, sadly, but they're gorgeous and they're about to tear them down. Um, and I find that a shame, actually. Um, and uh, Umar Az, yeah, I mean, it was very strange to me that they, they built this island. They could easily have gotten rid of it, but they just kept it there. It was a, they did try, they realized that it's much easier to uh, get oil if you're on land, which I think that was be a little bit obvious from the beginning. <laughs> um, but so there are all these remnants that are there. I find that int intriguing. Uh, somehow there are a lot of the places there, they just leave, yeah. which is very strange. In Abu Dhabi, where I'm living, they tear them down and build something new. In Kuwait, they just leave them. There's some very strange pieces of land that I've been documenting too, where let's say maybe a ruler gave it, the ruler of Kuwait gave it to someone from Bahrain or Saudi, <coughs> and they can't build on it uh, because they don't want to live in Kuwait, and they can't do anything commercially with it because it would be kind of rude. So it's just sitting there, and like in the middle of the city. And I find that those kinds of little patches of land a, a bit strange. Um, and intriguing. Yeah. What it says about the future, I think, I'm not sure that, I, that I'm trying to say something, maybe the end is indicate something about the future, but I think for right now, and I'm still in the process of making these images, um, it is really looking at where, it, uh, sort of, the, the development, where it is. It's not so much where it's going, it's where it is right now. Um, this is the first body of work that I did that was specific to a place. I think you see most of these other bodies of work, they're very anonymous and intentionally made so. As I was mentioning, I used the landscape as a kind of stage almost. Kuwait, I did a lot of the, the work was done very quickly, probably three months. Very intense shooting in about three months period because I had to do a new body of work for the Biennale. It had to be in Kuwait. Um, and my first, when I was asked to represent Kuwait, I said, no, I can't, there's not enough time. I've just taken on the new job at NYU, and I don't have enough time uh, to do something uh, for the show. I thought, this is absurd, let me give it a try, it's such a great opportunity. And then it sort of happened. I did a lot of the research online before I had any gone because I hadn't been to it for years. So this is actually the first time I was really setting up mapping places before I ever had been there. And I think only one of the places that probably come up there's a diving board. It was the only place that had personal significance in the sense that I used to go there and play basketball while I was in the league and that was a club that I used to play with. Um, in fact, going back to the ambiguity of the locations, most people I've talked with the gallery, not with this specific series, but in general about Tarek's work, that have never been to Abu Dhabi or the UAE or the greater Middle East, think that these are locations, I mean, we get everything from Mexico to Nevada to Turkey to, I mean, they can be anywhere. And I'll tell you, you know, you explain uh, specifics, you know, that they were taken specifically inside the outline. And I think it's interesting that this body of work is the first uh, obvious place um, in Tarek's work. I mean, we always get something other than uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, so it's an interesting that these landscapes can, uh, uh, can be seen in many different parts of the world. Well, they're not so, I mean, in the cave files, they're not, it's not such an expansive land. In a way, it's a lot more, um, you're inside a building, right. where you're, it's, you're, you're in a certain space all of a sudden. And I'm curious about your perspective on, and about the cave files. You kind of, we spoke earlier, yeah. and <laughs> I just speak to Tarek about this. <laughs>
Um, I don't, and I don't think they, that I, to me they're a little more obvious um, and literal than all the series from A to um, in, in consideration of this, actually. So I, you know, it's not my favorite series. Sorry, for Where's <laughs> <laughs> it's. I actually like that series more than a lot of the other ones. <laughs> and this is what I mean. Uh, maybe because it's new, but I th uh, somehow the, I think you could link the other ones. It's hard. To, I mean, it's it's newish, so it's hard to compare each one somehow. And I think. It's still a work in progress, but I, I somehow for me, I, I actually feel like they're more successful in a lot of ways. But that, that's my, you know. Also, and that will change, it may change. To chime in here, I also like this series better than the other series. <laughs> but also, yeah, it's too. Okay. But also, <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's good to have that. No, but more so, than, <laughs> more so than just because they're view, on view of my gallery and they're for sale. <laughs> it's also because if you get it tonight, you get a 10% discount. <laughs> but it's also because I'm, I'm, about, I'm, I'm not great with names and memory, and all of Tarek's previous work, they are different, but I, they have long and hard to memorize names that all sound similar. <laughs> and to me, they sort of, they're different, but they kind of blend into each other. They're all similar landscapes. But I think what this series is interesting is like a, a stop. You know, he's, he's changed tracks and is doing something new and different that the past four or five series, you know, are, are very not, not alike to this series. That's what I kind of like, like liked about this series. It's a big um, it's a big change from the previous. Um, and I think these works and the older works are a lot more linked with each other than this body of work. But I think it's good that um, the change. He changed and developed and did something completely yeah. new in a new location as well. Um, I, I mean, I like seeing them all. Um, I like having seen what came before K Files. And I think it's, to me, there was something, uh, you know, it was very striking. Those new images were very striking to me because, um, yes, they were, he was taking pictures of something different. Um, than, than this kind of, you know, sand, horizon line, sea, or sky, or, you know, so on. Um, but it, there's a connection for me. And um, it doesn't have to be a connection about, you know, the same place, but um, a connection in terms of perhaps even the idea of what a place could be, um, what it is, and, um, what it was, what it will be. And, and I think that kind of tracking through this presentness and into this past with the K-Files, I think that was quite striking. And adding to that um, the, the newspaper clippings that you, you um, unearthed about you know, your parents' um, lives and, and their social life lives, um, I, I, I think that is also very much connected um, to seeing this kind of moment of in-betweenness, of nothingness, but something about to come with something that is kind of in ruins now. Sorry, the work, I think part of this you're looking at this work, just come back to what you say. I don't see this, the it's different not. series, but it's all one big body of work. <laughs> They're labeled in a way for that too. It's not like bodies of work that have 100 images. They're actually 12 to 15 in each. So I think of them as just movements within a piece of say, music or like a paragraph within a novel or something that you can look at them as separate from each other. So that they need to be looked at together. And I think that's where the similarity is. You know? So it's not something I've been doing for five years to come up with each series. They're just small little movements that are linked. But I think this series was the biggest, I, I do agree, and you kind of have to see them together to see this movement, and they're not the same, but I think this body of work is the most different. Just because it's, I guess, obvious in place, architecture, buildings, um, interior, it's just the most um, aesthetically different, I guess.
the previous body of work. Yeah, because it doesn't belong to them. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think we're at a good place to yeah. wrap it up. Um, but before I hand it over to you guys for questions, I, um, I just wanted to end with just a really simple thought. Um, in reading through uh, Todd's new monograph, uh, Transfigurations, there's an essay by Kevin Mitchell where he quotes uh, Noel Arnaud's L'État de Bosch uh, with a very, very simple um, phrase. And he says, I am the space where I am. Um, and I thought that was kind of beautiful. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I, mean, I, I, I stand by what I 
And I uh, listen. Now I can dissect it, <laughs> but that's for you, not <laughs> Um, I would. I think it's a very interesting idea. I have a lot of material uh, stuff. That yeah. I found yeah. Thank you. Uh, oh, outside. Oh, yeah. Okay, one last question. Um, and it's not like completely conceptualized, so I'm not going to apologize. But I'm like interested, like, it's a concern about process, I suppose. Um, like, how much of your process, how much of your work is a conversation with yourself, and how much of it is a conversation with your viewer? Mm -hmm. Right, like, um, like what, what really draws me to a lot of, a lot of this work is the, the fact that it is like, you know, this, this, you know, it's, it's a conversation about myself and with myself and me situating myself in that kind of moment as an artist. But then again, like, there are some, like, definitely quite a set up and quite a like, you know, thought is going into, like, how the picture looks at this and, like, this very nice thing, you know, just, like, that, that, that happens. So I'm, I'm just interested in, like, or maybe, like, what's your um, driving force behind, behind those little conversations? Like, is it, are you trying to speak to, to a, to, to a specific audience, or are you having these conversations with yourself and letting the audience kind of like sneak in? I feel like I'm supposed to give a mass on my iPhone number. It's going to be free. No, it's a great question. I, I know it sounds like a, a cop out, but I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, uh, maybe sometimes more myself. I mean, it is, a, a lot of it is sort of figuring out and exploring relationships. You know, uh, for me to a place, to an idea, even, uh, and I think I really only know my relationship to it once I put it out on the wall and into the public somehow. And with the attention of the question, yeah, sort of. I have, I have a question that I think is related, um, and has to do with the way your concerns with the movie. Um, and are not at all about beauty, but when you look at the things themselves, they're incredibly beautiful photographs. And um, so are the way that you presented the uh, articles downstairs, they're mm -hmm. like absolutely not watering on this mm -hmm. um, diaset. And I wonder how that enters into the conversation, I guess maybe with your audience, but also just generally with the work. I think, I mean, I guess from a form and, and beauty, which is a form, and I think I did it. It's not, it's a means for me. I don't think, I love, I'm very much into You're very form. concerned with it. Pardon me? You're very concerned, aware of it. I think one has to be. I think any idea needs to be a relationship with form and, and content. I don't know how one separates the two somehow. And I am concerned with it. Um, You're and, more obsessive with it than a lot of others. I think a lot is maybe growing in a, in a design school, I think, uh, somehow more than a fine art school. I mean, I went to a fine art school, but I taught for many, for 17 years in a design school, and that's something I really respected from a design education. Uh, and I think there's a kind of accountability that's uh, somehow more demanded or expected in the design conversations than a lot of fine art school. Like it's a leap of faith into the object. Yeah. And you're just saying, yeah. 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 I'm going to go yeah. for the yeah. object, and this yeah. is why they don't only exist digitally, and this is how these things, this is how they deserve to exist. It's some leap of faith. She has an Hi, Mo. I have a question about um, the Sadiat series, and you know, so much of your work is it's not a like it's not your place, but now you're living on Sadiat, and I wonder how that affects your work in terms of thinking about that landscape and that space and how you would render it. I've been shooting there from about 2009, and I don't actually live there now. I just started teaching on Sadiat, and I was doing all the cameras just over. And I haven't shot there since we've moved there. Um, I don't know 
how it would affect really. It's, it's too early because we just moved there 60 days ago. And I, I still do think of it as mine. I almost feel like all the developments are intrusions because I was there from the very, like, that was, that's actually the first image I did on Saturday, I think 2009 or something. And it's really strange to find all these visitors. You know, it's almost like a playground to me. But it's interesting to think about you're actually now one of those people, right? You're on two sides of the coin and how that might affect your work. Because you're an you're an inhabitant inhabitant of the of that space. But I was back then also. That's what I'm gonna say. I mean like I feel like I was Right, but I guess I'm asking do you feel like that's changing at all? I don't know. Hmm. It's too early, like I said, we've been out there less than six years, so time yeah. the first uh, it'll be interesting to see. Um, I live going to work every day and I don't see it. But I used to go every day anyway, so, but I think now maybe I will have a, it could change. It, it's premature. Yeah, I'm talking about my mind. It's pretty interesting. Okay.